So where do you see the next designs? Can you give us any sneak peeks behind the, the current Flylight design skunk works? Yes, of course, there's going to be uh, new designs. Uh, Flylight, we've been looking at uh, what we call the pocket rocket or the seven metre squared. And I, I'm sure quite a few people are going to be listening. I mean, if we're going to go fast um, or fast single seat aircraft that will keep up with the current trend of two seater aircraft. <laughs> So, hi everyone and welcome back to the channel. I've had a few requests for this, but I wanted to do this interview anyway. And today we've got Mr. Ben Ashman, the man that designed and built my PB uh, on, the, uh, on the channel. And I've got a load of questions for him. So Ben, I hope you're, you're prepared for these questions. So let's get on with it. And the first question is, for those in the micro lighting world, especially the flex wing world, you are very, very no well known to the aviation industry. Um, so there is no real real need for the main introduction but for those that don't know you or know your background can you just give uh, a very brief introduction as to who you are um, and how you got into flying um <laughs> well yes as you can see i'm ben ashman it was a long long time ago it sounds like a, <laughs> a fairy tale i suppose i was always mad keen on flying um i was probably one i was not quite the baby boom um child but it was only a few years after well, 12 years after the end of the uh second world war and back then everybody aspired or every young lad aspired to being a fighter pilot or a spitfire pilot um it was in our blood i, I suppose my father was very keen on sailplaning and gliding um, albeit he wasn't in a financial position to be able to do uh, sailplaning and gliding. So he um, he would be at the back end of uh, flying sailplanes and gliders, and he would be flying vintage gliders, which right. I suppose in a way was, was good for me because it meant that there was a lot of maintenance on these machines. Um, my dad was uh, always visiting um, people uh, or other pilots who were building their aircraft or maintaining their aircraft, rebuilding crashed aircraft. So in that sense, I developed, developed a bit of background knowledge and I could see how uh, aircraft went together. Anyway, as it progressed on and I became a bit older, I realised I wasn't going to be able to afford to fly these aircraft. And then lo and behold, at the age of 15, hang gliding hit the, uh, hit the scene. Had a magazine at the time. Now, if <laughs> anybody who's equally as old as I am, which there's probably not so many, uh, will remember a magazine called The Look and Learn. Things. And then they ran a feature uh, on the hang gliding in the early days in 1972 in, uh, in America, the Otto Lilienthal meeting. I think it might have been 1971. And I suddenly saw this and I saw immediately saw a route into aviation uh, or personal aviation. So uh, gathered a few friends of mine together and uh, we raised the principal sum of three pounds and we built uh, or we bought all the materials and built our own hang glider out of wood and polythene. Wow. Um, it, it, it sounds as though it's a recipe to uh, fail. <laughs> um, but um, amazingly, it flew little bit of fiddling around. The most amazing part was that at the age of 15, when we when I designed this, um, or basically designed, I copied it from... Uh, I was going to say, was it from plans? Or? No, no, I took the photographs and I learned how to scale things by picking a, an element that I knew would be a specific size, like somebody's head, um, and scaled it out that way. Uh but uh, yeah, the, the hang glider flew. Um, but the basic, most amazing thing was my parents actually encouraged us to do it. Um, wow. And that, that was the start. From then on, I, um, with other friends and people around at the time, designed and built something like 13, 14 different hang gliders, various designs over the next three years. Um, and that, 
was essentially how I got into the um, into the extreme sports of hang gliding. Where did the microlight piece come from? Because uh, I'm I'm not going to jump the questions, but how did the microlighting piece stem from the hang gliding? Was that just a desire to stay airborne longer? Um, it was a well, it, it was a funny one actually because. Um, one of the hang gliders that uh, I, I don't know why I, I, I had this vision of flying a biplane, and while I was designing the flex wing uh, Rogolo type hang gliders, I wanted to build a more conventional style uh, wing, a rigid wing, and the biplane design uh, design with the Pratt and Whitney truss sort of structure so it could, which could be very light and at the same time very strong and that inspired me enough to sort of actually design and we built or I say we built I built uh, this biplane up but um, unfortunately going to college and going to to do a degree course in fine arts sort of got in the way and I never actually got round to flying it but the, the idea was to, to fly it, realising that it would be of limited performance, but to stick an engine on it, a simple engine on the front. On the front? Uh, go, on the front. Okay. Um, but uh, to go, go skimming around uh, sort of low level over the fields and over the hedges and trees and so forth. And this sort of embedded a, a passion in me for for the potential of power flight. I never intended to get into my colliding as such, uh, not in the way that I did. And it, it, was, it wasn't a direct route in from hang gliding into my colliding for me. And it was a form of convenience. I could go up to the local field, which would be two miles away, where I could keep a my colite, and I would be able to go flying for an hour or two without having to get into a car, drive 100 on miles way to the nearest hill, sit there, realise you're on the wrong hill, go to, <laughs> to another. <laughs> generally, the mic lighting was an easier way to be able to maintain my responsibilities as a father. So, yeah, that's, that's how I got into mic lighting. Uh, if, we, if we sort of drag you forward, I don't want to say drag you forward to present day because there's there's a lot of history behind the, the single seat aircraft that you are renowned for, such as the Dragonfly, the, the Dragon Chaser, all those up to the PB. You know, it's on the wall here. You focus single seat. How did the concept come about, especially, and I know a lot of people have been intrigued by your latest design. How did the retractable wheels come about? Why did you think, I've got to make the wheels go away? What was that? moment where you go it's got to have retracts one of the reasons well it, it's my hand gliding background everything is uh taken into consideration anything that produces drags taken into consideration right. sticking wheels out one of two things sticking the wheels out in the open air um you realize there's drag and on a, an aesthetic level and all aesthetics are built up on a form of paranoia I suppose <laughs> is uh, wanting to avoid so if you see something that's you know you know that's going to be producing drag it's therefore you know you want to remove it or you want to do something with it on a technical side there's obviously it's it's a more com complex structure so for a designer it's just it, it's, it's making things just a little bit more difficult I suppose uh, to be able to um, fold the wheels away and to bring them back out at will. Um, there's been many, many examples of people folding the wheels away unintentionally by hitting hedges. Well, I've, I've known gliders do that. I used to call it the white line trophy, and the, the, yeah, the, the longest white, white line would, uh, would get the champ and a big bill for a big gel coat replacement. Yeah, the white line trophy. Plus, on, on the Michael Ike side, so one of the funniest stories was uh, a couple of Irish um, customers of ours with an air creation kiss, I think it was taking off they left the airfield with their undercarriage on and after they ran through the hedge <laughs> the <fire. laughs> they landed wheels up well the wheels weren't there <laughs> i have actually uh, missed two to a very distinctive air aircraft that's uh, that you are famous for and i can't believe i've missed it off my list was the doodle bug the doodle bug yes i was going to come back on to that um essentially there was a period in my life where um i ran a well, I, I sort of studied as a fine artist, realised that there was 
virtually no money in that. And also there was a lot of um, there was a lot of clutter involved with fine art. There's a there's a lot of people that could talk a good talk, but <laughs> wouldn't actually do anything. Uh, the art critics, we all know what they're like. Um, and I didn't really gel with that society. Sort of ran for 15 years uh, as a printer. The microlighting then came in. As I said, I had a young family and that, that was uh, a form of convenient convenience to be able to keep flying and I, I didn't really know what my dream was but it, it all all the time it was this yearning to build and develop and to get to know um to get to know what my passion was I was lucky enough to go and do some big television work um in Africa and uh, Jordan and uh, various other places um, and that started showing me that you know, that this is what I really wanted to do was to be uh, have a closer involvement. And then another opportunity came in to join forces with Paul, Paul Dewhurst, develop Flylight uh, and uh, sort of start start getting into more into a, a business, a flying business. Flylight at the time had already been created and been running for a year with Paul and a chap called Kevin, Kevin Jones. So I bought Kevin out um, and then got involved and started training. We were specifically just a training outlet and um, selling on other people's microlights. Eventually, the CAA deregulated uh, powered uh, foot launched hang gliding and powered uh, powered flight so that which year was that which year did that happen that was 1999 uh mark turner who was representing the bhpa um and a few others and i do apologize if i missed the names out um they along with the caa uh sort of worked to deregulate powered foot launched um hang gliders or gliders and so that then left us with an opportunity that, hey, we could build this. We're, you know, I can design up something, a harness. But um, having now flown trikes for a period of time, I realised the trike, uh, the method of flying a trike and the control position um, was a lot more relaxing than the prone position uh, with a hang glider. I've always found, uh, I've always noticed that in videos and, and uh, especially watching like Darren Brown's videos. It's like the next like that. It's like that just doesn't feel comfortable for long flights, yeah. does it? You always know an old hang glider pilot. Yeah, they've got bad bad necks and neck pains and so <laughs> bad knees, bad backs and bad knees. Yeah, but um, the uh, that set me um, set me a challenge to come up with something. Uh, that was going to be a lot, a lot more comfortable to fly. And there was a method of flying hang gliders then called Supro. But to go back and have a very safe, simple uh, hang glider, one that would be easy, light to carry and so forth, and you could fly it seated or you could fly it prone, that paved the way for coming up with the doodle bug if we could make a harness to fit that flight supra and overcome the problems with um, having a seat that will support you being able to run in it um, it's un unlike a, a paramotoring seat which can actually clasp if it's not fitted correctly can clasp you around the back of the legs and restrict you running yeah um, the doodle bug had a complete a seat that would actually fall right away from you when you stood upright and you could go belting across the field full full pelt and then as the as your bum sank in and you tipped back in the seat then the uh, thigh supports would come up and support you and for, then, for those that aren't quite sure what a doodle bug looks like I'll, I'll put on the the screen now just so you can uh, see what it looks like and then <laughs> i'll put a link to in the description a few of the videos because they, they are very very unique but to, to move on from that slightly, and, and I suppose in, in a way it does answer part of question, my, my previous question, that actually the doodle bug did have retractable undercarriage as well, didn't it? Exactly. I was just going to drop onto that, but that's where retractable undercarriage came from. When, right. uh You needed somewhere to put your feet, uh, so you put your feet in a stirrup, 
you don't want the stirrup dangling in in the way when you're coming into land so it needs to hoist up over the top over your uh the top of your head and there's no better place then to attach the stirrup to the legs and yeah. when you pull the stirrup down that pulls the legs up and yeah. out of the way yeah. and now you've got it you've got your retractable undercarriage However, that bears no resemblance whatsoever to, <laughs> to the dragonfly retract of a land carriage. Dragonfly and the yeah. Adam, yeah. which uh, which came later. So yeah, the Doodlebug was uh, a fantastic machine. I would probably still be flying a Doodlebug if I hadn't have had uh, quite a serious snowboarding accident in two thousand and five. Sub seventy uh, since the two thousand and sixteen exemption that the the CAA have allowed us, and I use it as a as a privilege, not a right. And we are privileged to have that exemption for sub seventy. The sub seventy seems to have sparked a, resurg- a, a kind of resurgence in my mind of small, lightweight flex wings. How did the PB come about? Was it there before? sub 70 and that allowed it to flourish or did the sub 70 exemption allow you to design into it it's basically like well i have to go back uh, um, to the dragonfly the dragonfly came about as soon as the caa deregulated single seat microlites so long as they were below 115 kilos we'd already had the exercise with the doodlebug when there was a change of legislation so um we jumped onto that and came up with that design the dragonfly came about um uh, again with a change of legislation and we needed to be there so we've now started to develop this pattern of watching what happened to legislation um and took guidance from that so the next time when the pb well with the sub 70 aircraft it was it was quite interesting because we didn't really know whether it would be attractive or not. But my opinion on it was if we didn't do something, if we weren't prepared for it, then if it became attractive, we would have nothing to offer. So and, and it was a quite nice challenge to make something a lot lighter. Back in the 80s, there were all there existed a class called sub-70 um, kilo aircraft. But you, it didn't have the caveat of the fuel uh, fuel limitation. So you, it was just basically the empty weight of the aircraft had to be below 70 kilos. From the experience that I got from that was that it wasn't an easy thing to do to make a sub-70 aircraft because back then a lot of people claimed their aircraft was sub-70, but they would be like 90 kilos, 85 kilos. We've had, you know, because of uh, history now, we've had the opportunity to be able to weigh a lot of these aircraft and see that they woefully overweight. There weren't that many that genuinely were below 70 kilos. So it started making you realise it's not going to be an easy thing to go and do but the paramotoring market moved in the right direction at the same time because paramotors at the time were being influenced by the likes of Polini with the 4250 the likes of Corsair the likes of Vitarazzi and so forth all started coming out with very lightweight engines and it happened just at the right time with sub-70 so we could grab a lightweight engine with um, more than enough power. Yeah, I can I can akin to that. I generally back yeah, off the, the moment I've taken off. <laughs> the structures they were dead, well, our basic structure, the dragonfly frame. We looked at that, removed the retracts, uh, saves a load of weight, um, drill a load of lighting lightning holes uh, within it, change one or two parts of the structure for lighter weight materials, but still. Uh, more than strong enough to uh, to offer the safety that uh, the dragonfly gave. Yeah, and um, lo and behold, uh, the PB came around. There was a little bit of styling that we had to do, um, which, going back to my early days as uh, you know an art student, it's always a joy to to um to sculpt these things, and that satisfies my passion. And uh, your recent Adam design. I love the wing. I think it's amazing. Um, it's, it's taken a lot from your other designs, but what makes this aircraft so special to you? Well, along, there, there's two elements to this. Um, always uh, going into sub-70 again, we, 
uh, you're relatively limited on what you can do and what you can't do. You can see that on uh, on our competitors' aircraft; they're very limited, uh, and, and we were the same with the PB. Right. But um, to be able to produce something that I'm sort of thinking. You know, to be able to bring a retractable undercarriage in would uh, would be, I know it sounds quite arrogant, but it would be a little bit of prowess to be able to bring a retractable undercarriage into a sub-70 aircraft and also make it mould into a very, very lightweight fairing instead of yeah. the fiberglass fairing that we had with the Dragonfly. Mm. So it was a design challenge, um, and it's one that... Uh, I wanted to do originally, but I sort of, I was sort of very much, you know, full on with the, um, with the normal PB design. And then there was a big life changing moment for everybody. COVID hit. Um, I lost my brother, uh, my elderly brother to, to COVID and it knocked me sideways. I realized that life's short. I can you, relate to that. Sometimes you have to put other things forward. Uh, sometimes you neglect things without realising that actually you shouldn't neglect it. You should bring it forward. If you don't do it, mm. you may never have an opportunity to do it. So I spoke with, uh, for those that don't know, Flylight and Eros work very closely together. Eros is a Ukrainian uh, hang glider and wing designer. And they're also an outsourced uh, supplier for for Flylight for a lot of our projects, sky range and projects and so forth. And their designer, their flexing designer, Sergey, um, and I sort of put our heads together as we have done with uh, many of the wings. And um, that's where the Adam came about. Um, I wanted a lightweight, uh, simple soaring wing. Uh, so I wanted more efficiency than we had from the Fox 13T wing. I didn't want to increase the weight any greater, but I wanted um, something that was going to maintain the light handling and, co and good coordination, handling coordination, as the Fox 13T wing already has. Mm. I wanted the sync rate to be better. Yeah. And I wanted the glide to be better. I wasn't looking for something to have faster speed. Although now it is marginally faster than the Fox 13T wing. Um, but the danger is with sub-70, if you start going faster, the thing won't go slow enough. Um, yeah. You keep moving the, uh, the polar sort of forwards and you'll lose that slow end speed, which you've got to be very yeah. aware of for sub-70. Rather than flattening the polar curve, you just shift it along. You just shift it along. Yeah. What I have done, or what Sergey and, and I have done, is managed to be able to flatten the polar by by just fairing out the uh, the costumes. Nice. Uh, but there are uh, there are certain considerations that you have to take into account. It's not quite that easy because mm. you, by introducing a double surface, the mean. Uh, in camber is reduced, so your coefficient of lift goes down some, somewhat. Right. So you have to be fairly careful um, in in what you do to maintain the, the slow end. Um, but it, it it's worked. Um, the other side is there is um, how little horsepower can you use to power this? We've well, used uh, a, a, it's it's like atom and there's all the A's in your design, isn't there? So it's, it's used the <laughs> yes. atom eighty. Yeah, somebody's going to come up. If, if we actually got around to putting the Atom 80 on the air or sand, then we've got the uh, Atom oh. Atom. <laughs> that sounds like a nightmare. Uh, uh, yeah, but uh, no, it's, uh, it was interesting to go. It was quite brave to go and do it, to purchase uh, an Atom 80, because mm. you're sort of thinking, you know, is it going to work? Is it not going to work? It's all very, it will work quite nicely, well, as you know from experience. The Atom is great on a paramotor. Uh, yeah. if you aren't too large a person and flow it flying at slower speeds as well the you can extract the efficiency out of the engine that you need to stay aloft now if you move you know as soon as you sort of go faster um 
you know, you're requiring lots more power. The only way to not do that is to make the wing more efficient. Uh, the first time I sat in the machine with an Atom 80, which is a, a brilliant engine, I am loving it a lot, um, but to, to put your foot down and then the thing trundles off and comes off, off the ground, and not only that, starts climbing at a reasonable, you know, an acceptable level. Yeah. So, I know, but, I know from your video, we've yeah. even got uh, Paul flying. It was he, he's 100 kilos, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. more. He's a, no, he's a solid he, unit, shall we say. I'll be polite, Paul. Don't kick me next time you see me, sorry. He, float, he floats between 90 and 100. It yeah. just depends how, how good the living is. You can you know <laughs> when fly light's doing bad because Paul's weight comes down. Right. <laughs> but, uh, no, seriously, we put Paul in it. Um, yeah, Paul, I would say, is is above the weight limit um, for the Atom 80-powered Atom. Yeah. Um, I think Paul was only barely managing to get between 200 and 300 feet per minute climb rate um, but you designed it purely as a thermal aircraft anyway didn't you it was to get you to height to have to get into thermals and it, and... it was yes that's one of the principal design objects it, it isn't the absolute design object in other words it will still be a very good um tora i mean i mean it will uh, it will come along the only so it, it will it will uh, fly quite happily along with all the other aircraft. The only thing is, I would have to watch you putting your sleeping bags and your tents and everything else. <laughs> and I, um, on the Adam, it's not not quite so easy. You've got two bloody great wheels sitting behind you. Yeah, you you, you've you've lost there. all that storage space because you put the wheels in the way. Exactly. In a way, the the name the Adam obviously is to honour my brother. Um, right. I didn't know how Eros were going to take it because they usually like to name name the wings, but mm. no, Eros were all full, full, fully behind us. Nice, um, and it's just for me, it's a very touching, uh, yeah. touching thing to have to be able to keep my brother and his memory alive yes. for a long time. And that's hopefully, a, that's a lovely be, sentiment that it will be as significant as the PB and. Uh, the Doodlebug and other aircraft that we've we've produced. Well, talking about other aircraft you you produce, uh, and there's a lot of designs in that head of yours. So, where do you see the next designs? Can you give us any sneak peeks behind the the current Flylight design skunk works? To say, uh, for want of a term, I know there's lots of design going on, but anything new likely to come out in the future? Yes, of course, there's going to be uh, new designs coming out and uh, there's no pretense with uh, Flylight we've been looking at uh, what we call the pocket rocket or the seven meter squared uh, aircraft um, and I, I'm sure quite a few people are going to be listening I mean if we're going to go fast um, or fast single seat aircraft that will keep up with the current trend of two seater aircraft then we're going to be SSDR where you will need a license to be able to fly them yeah. And, I, and I found that when my, my PB's now gone, as you know, you put the lettering on, uh, SSDI, it, it just shifts everything along slightly, doesn't it? Uh, sort of going faster, uh, going faster with small wings and the store speeds coming up, minimum speed going up, is uh, it, it goes firmly into the SSDR bracket. Yeah. So on that side... We're looking at uh, we're, the other thing that that limits it is actually getting a sensible, useful engine. Mm. Uh, now there is one manufacturer who's um, developing up uh, reasonable power, uh, powerful engines. One that we've used before, and we know it will power um, the chaser it's sort of quite quite happily. Um, so the next step will be developing that aircraft not the chaser it will be a topless uh topless wing it'll be yeah. very small it isn't going to be as small as we can possibly go but it should be able to keep up and i say this quite bravely the intention is for it to be able to keep up with the current trip the current breed of uh, contemporary flex wing micro nice. two uh, so going back into more of the skunk works types of um of, of design work we've talked about power 
and the need for lots of power. So let's look at the other end. And there's actually a, a guy that follows my channel who's, who's posted a question, and it's Andre. I believe it's how you pronounce your name. Um, and his question is, yes, I want to know about the 30-minute full electric PB powered by a cheap electric power system, something that sports pilots can afford and that will let them go thermaling or ridge for total engine off happiness. Uh, is that likely to be achievable in the near future? Well, it's achievable right now. Um, if somebody wanted to... I'm sure to... will come back and go, why is it not been done now? Come on, <laughs> get it out there. Well, we, I've done one or two projects uh, where I've been commissioned to, to build and design um, aircraft, uh, non-standard aircraft. So in other words, they're not from our portfolio of uh, available airplanes. The two in question that most people will know is the Fox Tug uh, yeah. uh, for towing up hang gliders. Uh, that was a commission. Um, and also the Sea Dragon, uh, which is the float plane. Um, if somebody came along and said, uh, could you fit uh, an electric motor and batteries to, say, a PB, um, we, we know which motor and we know which batteries to go and use. Uh, so we could actually build that. The only problem that you have at the moment is the most creditable uh, um, electric motor and controllers and battery systems available at the moment are from Giga in Germany. You know, reput or, or reputable items have a, have a cost to them, so they are relatively expensive, quite a lot more expensive than a two-stroke engine. Yeah. The current uh, Eros actually do this with their e and they've made they've made a few they haven't made that many but they have been progressing and it's a it's a would the electric option aircraft. come into the sub 70 or would it only because of sheer weight uh, of batteries and bssdr that's that's where i was going to say on that the um the e ant isn't sub 70 uh but it does have a duration of one to one and a half hours flying right if we go to sub 70 to squeak it into sub 70 we would have i uh, ironically it will be about 30 minutes so i don't know if yeah. uh andre has uh actually got inside information here or not, but, uh, <laughs> well andre yeah. get in contact with flylight they may be able to custom make you uh, an electric pb oh. So we're coming to the last question, Ben, because there, there's just, I mean, we could chat for hours. I've, uh, for those that don't know, I've actually tried to interview Ben a number of times. Uh, a 10 minute video ended up being 45 minutes and that was just two stories. So there are many, many stories and many adventures that Ben's achieved. But I'm going to ask you the ultimate question. If all your machines were lined up in front of you, everything that you've designed since the, since the 90s uh, were lined up in front of you, which one would you pick and why? Uh, without a shadow of doubt, the uh, Adam. Yeah, yeah. And why? Because it's at the pinnacle of uh, the pinnacle of my design career, I suppose. There's yeah. more knowledge in the Adam than any of the other machines that I've built. Fair enough. I think that's uh, that's a very uh, poignant answer as well, and I can uh, I can completely <laughs> relate to that. So anyway, we'll, uh, we'll leave this video here. If you've got any questions for Ben, either drop them in the comments or contact them at Flylight. Uh, Flylight have supported me very, uh, very well with spares when I've uh, needed them. And, uh, and, I, and I thank you, Ben, and the team for that. Uh, and I say, we'll leave this video here. So until next time, everybody, fly safe. Please, can I just make one more comment? Yeah. For everybody out there, Please subscribe, get all your friends to sub subscribe because Giles at some point in the future may earn enough money to have that wall plastered. <laughs>